Hello there. Thanks for being here. My name is Amir. I'm a consultant surgeon based in the UK. And on this channel, I pass on what I know and what's worked for me to help medical students and young doctors succeed. In today's video, we're going to talk about chest x-rays. Chest x-rays are very important for obviously exams and OSCEs, but also for everyday real life doctoring at the coalface. This video is going to be divided into a few sections. I'm going to start off by talking about what chest x-rays or what x-rays generally are. Uh, I'm going to explain the difference between a PA and an AP radiograph, which confuses some people. We're going to discuss how to talk about uh, radiographs generally and uh, chest x-rays specifically. I'm going to go through a normal chest x-ray and my system for um, going through uh, a chest x-ray so I don't miss anything. And then we're going to go through some examples of abnormal chest x-rays with some disease processes and some interesting things that you can see uh, on the chest x-rays very commonly. So with that, let's get started. Chest x-rays are essentially shadow graphs. What that means is that x-rays fly through the air and land on a film uh, and essentially leave a shadow. And depending on what the material is between the x-ray source and the film, it leaves a shadow of varying density. In fact, some people, some pedantic people, don't like to use the word x-rays for what you see and what you read and what you use, because x-rays are invisible and they fly through the air. What we see in everyday clinical practice are radiographs. And then, of course, x-rays blacken film, so this is a good way to remember the density of the materials between the x-ray source and the film. So the more dense something is, the whiter it is. So metallic objects like a hip replacement or a pacemaker or dental filling, for example, they all look very white. And then, uh, and then obviously, bone less, looks less white um, and soft tissue and uh, fluid, etc., etc. Okay, so now let's discuss this thing about AP versus PA, which uh, is a very important thing to, uh, to grasp. X-rays, as we discussed earlier, are just things that fly through the air. And as they do, they diverge. Uh, unlike, for example, lasers, which are monocolumetic, and they go up into one, they go into space, into infinity, in, in one column, they don't diverge. And if you've ever had a chest X-ray, what they do is get you to stand next to the film as close to it as possible, and is usually taken on deep inspiration. And the reason why they do that is because as the X-ray source uh, emits the X-rays, they kind of diverge. And the closer something is to the X-ray source, the bigger its shadow will be on the film. So what you want is the thing that you want to take a picture of as close to the film as possible. You know, if you, for example, when you were a child, when you played uh, shapes on the wall with the light behind you, you would notice that the closer you are to the to the light, the bigger the, 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 the shadow was. And so an AP film, the heart is slightly further away from the film and so there's a little bit more divergence of those rays as it goes through. And so the shadow of the heart on the chest x-ray, on the chest radiograph, looks bigger so this can fool you if you, for example, are trying to assess for cardiomegaly in a situation like congestive cardiac failure. And so this is really, really important to understand uh, when you're discussing chest radiographs. So if we have a look here, this is a plain PA chest radiograph, a normal chest X-ray. And if you look at the size of the heart between the two cardiophrenic angles, we'll go through this in a bit, in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, it looks normal, but if you look at the next one, which is an AP film, the shadow of the heart looks much, much bigger. And also the mediastinum looks much, much wider. And so this is very important to mention and also to bear in mind if you're, for example, interpreting this chest x-ray for cardiomegaly. So now let's talk about how kind of to start talking about not just chest x-rays, but any radiographs. The best way to start is this is a chest x-ray of so-and-so taken on such and such a date and is of acceptable diagnostic quality. If you start like that, then your examiner will relax and know that you have done this before, but also um, it gives you uh, the audience 
um, the sort of four walls of what you're talking about. So just to give you an example here, this is a chest radiograph or chest x-ray of Jane Doe taken yesterday and it's of acceptable diagnostic quality. So just going back one slide here, I've put here the time and the reason for that is if it's part of a series, for example, if you've got a sick patient on the ward and they have three chest x-rays on the same day, you want to kind of mention the time as well. So what does diagnostic quality mean? It means that is basically useful for diagnosing things on as a, as a doctor. So exposure is essentially how white or black it is. And a good guide to this is whether you can see the thoracic vertebrae through the uh, shadow of the heart. Rotation, which means whether the patient is kind of as straight on as possible. They're not tilted or rotated. Um, and I'll go through those, how to, how to assess that in a moment. And then there are no missing important bits. So for example, if they're cut off at the costophrenic angles, then that's not diagnostically acceptable because you can't assess whether there is a, a, a fluid level or, you know, it, this applies to all x-rays incidentally. This is, insert the name of the x-ray, of, insert the name of the patient, taken on, insert the date and or time if appropriate, and is of acceptable diagnostic quality. Okay, so now let's talk about some chest x-rays. Incidentally, I'm just gonna use the word chest x-ray just because it's easier. So again, this is a chest x-ray of Joe Bloggs taken on such and such a date and is of acceptable diagnostic quality. I noticed that it's a PA film. Now, there are many different systems for um, describing a chest x-ray. There's the A, B, C, D, E one. There's a heart tissue one and then soft tissue. So start with heart tissue and, and then soft tissues. I usually just start uh, from the middle and work my way out. You can start from the outside, work your way in. It really doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as you know uh, your own system and you're consistent and you don't miss important bits out. So if you start from the middle, these things are the spinous processes of the um, upper thoracic and lower cervical vertebrae. And you can see that they're bang in the middle. Uh, so the patient is not rotating uh, his or her head. And also another way to tell is the, the, uh, the fact that they're equidistant between the two heads of the clavicles. So this is well rotated. It's well exposed because I can see the uh, lumbar, uh, well, lower thoracic and lumbar vertebrae through, through the film. So in the midline, you also notice the, uh, the uh, trachea, which you can see very well here. And then it divides into the right and left main bronchi. Where it does that is called the carina. And the right main bronchus usually is a bit more vertically orientated. They're pretty much the same, but the left main bronchus is slightly more horizontal because obviously you've got the heart underneath it. So this is a common exam question. So if somebody inhales a peanut or something, um, or they've got aspiration pneumonia, they're much more likely to get uh, something that's more likely to go down the right main bronchus rather than the left. Also in the midline, you notice the, just to the left of the midline, you notice this, this thing called the aortic knuckle because the aorta is coming up into the film and then going back down. It's her you know, posterior uh, structure, retroperitoneal in the abdomen. You notice that uh, these are the outlines of the vessels. And also in this area, you would also notice uh, hyla lymphadenopathy. Uh, we'll, go, we'll show an example of that later on. Uh, and then the, the cardiophrenic angles, so the left and the right cardiophrenic angles ideally should be nice and sharply defined. And then you, as you work your way out towards the uh, periphery, you count all the ribs. You obviously notice, you check for any fractures or any lesions. Um, you then Follow, follow on towards the periphery, you check for the costophrenic angles and you want to make sure that again they're nicely uh, sharply defined and if they're not, um, a common example of when they're not is if there's a, a little fluid level here um, which blunts that sharp angle and that's called a meniscus, so something like a pleural effusion. Then obviously you want to check all the um, periphery of the lung fields uh, here you would things, find things like mesotheliomas or, or um, pneumothoraces. Then you want to check obviously the skin um, and if there's air outside the lung fields 
in the skin. That's called surgical emphysema. You'll see that in, for example, a rib fracture. Um, a few other notable things to um, mention uh, is that the right hemidiaphragm is usually normally a little bit higher than the left hemidiaphragm because obviously you've got the liver uh, tucked up just underneath it. I'll show an example of when that is not the case. Here you can see the gastric bubble, a uh, bit of bubble, uh, bubble of air in the, in the stomach. If you were looking for free air under the diaphragm, this would be a very, very thin sliver here usually, which would indicate some free air in the, in the abdomen. And here's another one. This is the one I showed you earlier. Uh, this is obviously of a female. And again, all the structures are there. You can see beautifully the carina dividing uh, into the right and main, left main bronchus. Right, so let's have a look at some abnormal chest x-rays. So here you can see this is a portable AP erect chest x-ray. Uh, portable means obviously the x-ray machine had to be taken to the patient and AP means obviously the cardiac shadow is a bit misleading and uh, so this is an idea that this gives you an idea that the patient was slightly unwell they couldn't really stand in front of a machine and up here you can see the these are clips the uh, patient has had a fairly major head and neck uh, operation these are drains coming down here and there's an NG tube going down into the stomach. So this is the area I wanted to show you, which shows an area of right basal collapse and consolidation, usually as a result of a mucus plug, for example, blocking one of the um, uh, bronchioles and distal collapse in a sort of post-operative patient, very common situation. And this is what low bar pneumonia looks like. This is a similar sort of situation, but obviously a lot more. Uh, extensive and a complete whiteout of the right base. This is an example of hyalur lymphadenopathy. So as you can see, these areas are very prominent and you can see this in cancers. Uh, you can see this in um, things like uh, TB or sarcoid, as was the case in this situation. And a little pro tip here in exam, sometimes they ask, what is the commonest malignancy? So they're talking about cancer now. What is the commonest malignancy of the lungs versus what is the commonest malignancy in the lungs? So it's very important to listen to the examiner or read the question very carefully. The commonest malignancy in the lungs is metastasis, by far the commonest kind of malignancy in the lungs. The commonest malignancy of the lungs is bronchogenic carcinoma, you know, in smokers, for example. This is an example of a pneumothorax. This is about as subtle as a barn door, but there are much more, usually much more subtle than this. You just see a very, very thin sliver around the margin. Um, obviously, you can see, as we discussed earlier, the air, uh, air is blacker than uh, lung fields. Um, and this is an example of a chest drain. This is not the same patient, but this is how uh, pneumothoraces are usually treated. And that's how what a chest drain looks like. And they're designed to be radio opaque, both at the tip and the line, which there's a break here, as you can see, there are holes in the um, chest drain tube to, to suck the air on or fluid, as the case may be. This is an example of a hyperinflated lung. You see this in uh, COPD, for example, um, and you can see the right hemidiaphragm is much flatter. It's not that nice dome shaped, and the reason for that is because the lungs are hyperinflated. And another pro tip here is, for example, when you're uh, uh, examining the abdomen. You might feel a liver edge and you might say, aha, there's hepatomegaly here, the liver is enlarged. Whereas in fact, that might not be the case. It just might be that the lungs are hyperinflated. The patient has COPD, which is much more, much more common than uh, hepatomegaly. And basically the lungs are just pushing the, the liver down. So that's what you're feeling, not an enlarged liver, just a normal liver pushed down. So just very quickly, a few examples of bits and bobs that you can see on x-rays. These are ECG leads. And, you know, obviously the, the wires are connecting them. This is obviously a very um, nice example of a pacemaker. Um, here, this is not a great x-ray, but you can see a tracheostomy tube. You can also see an NG tube that goes down into the stomach. You know that for sure because it's below the diaphragm. That's one way you can tell that it's in the right place rather than in the lungs. You can also aspirate some acid gastric content from it. Um, so that's what a uh, tracheostomy tube looks like. And this is an example of a uh, patient who's had a valve replacement. 
And as we said earlier, metals look much whiter, much more dense on x-rays. And these things are uh, stenotomy suture wires that have been used to close the bone. Uh, and obviously you can see a nice scoliosis in the vertebrae here. Thank you very much for watching to the very end. As always, if you got value out of this video, I'd really appreciate it if you can hit the like button and subscribe to my channel and also maybe spread the word, you know, share it on your socials. Uh, thank you very much again and I'll see you in the next one.